Good to be with you today. We thank God for the blessings that He has given us this week. Haven't they been good? Amen. And uh, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. We believe that uh, prayer is so important and the most important thing as we pray for the power of the Holy Spirit now to give us understanding of His Word. And so we welcome those who join us wherever you may be around the world. We're going to kneel and have prayer together at this time. Merciful Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege that we have to open the, the, book called, the precious book called the Bible. We need proper understanding of your word. We realize that it's impossible without the power of thy spirit. So we invite thy spirit to come near to our hearts. Open our ears, our minds, that we may receive those things which you have in store for us. And I know you have a gift for each and every one of us today. That gift is eternal life, and we find it in these precious pages. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We always encourage each and every one to bring their Bibles. It's very, very important we bring our Bibles as, as we study the Word of God together. Now remember, you always, we should be studying to show ourselves what? Approved unto God. We're going to be talking about standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of God. How many, by the way, just you don't have to raise your hand, but think in terms of how many have been standing on God's promises this week? Think about it. Has there come something in your life that developed that you really didn't, you, there wasn't a way out? But you reached out by faith and you got a hold of the promise that God has left you. And as you got a hold of that promise and you claimed that promise, God was able to work something good for you. I know He has in my life and I know He has in yours. I'd like for us to take our Bibles and turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Found in the New Testament, 2 Peter chapter 1. Now we're going to read about standing on the promises of God. And when you talk about standing on something, that means we're going to be claiming those promises, aren't we? 2 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to read several verses, so you kind of keep your finger there if you will. Finger there in the Word of God. 2 Peter chapter what? 1. We're going to be reading verse, start with verse 4. Notice it says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding and great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped, notice this, the corruption that is in the world through lust. This is very powerful verses that are here. Now, we're going to go back and discuss these a little bit later, but right now I'd like to skip to verse 10. Verse 10, this will be our foundation for today. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligent to make your, what is the word? Your calling and election sure. Notice this, if you do these things, ye shall never fall. These are powerful words. Notice what it says. If you do these things, right? If you do these things, ye shall what? Never fall. But we find in our Christian experience many times that we're slipping and we're falling and we're, we're going down and we're getting back up. Why? The Bible is very clear if we do what? These things. What are these things? We must discover these things. We will never fall. Is that God's plan for us, by the way? I believe that's God's plans for us, that we would never fall, right? Living in and through Him, that we would live that victorious life. See, Peter, in 2 Peter, and first 1 Peter and 2 Peter both, it's very interesting, when Peter began to be inspired by the Holy Ghost and sat down and began to write, he was always writing warnings. Isn't that interesting? Warnings. Do we need warnings today? Absolutely. He was, he was warning the Christians of the course that they were taking. He was warning him of the time that they were living, and by the way, it's even more real for us today of what Peter had written here. He was warning about something called false teachers. Maybe you've run across a few false teachers, a few false witnesses. And the only way we can know them is if we know the Word of God. Isn't that right? If we don't know the Word of God, we're not going to know if it's true or if it's false. And so, in order to... Peter was one of those kind of guys that liked to expose something when it was wrong. You remember reading about him and some of the stories about the Apostle Peter, that sometimes he spoke before he thought. 
But here under the pen of inspiration, he was exposing their teachings of these false teachers. Now that kind of gives me a little bit of uh, information that today God wants us to also do some what? Exposing. If something that's being taught is false. If it's not a true teaching, then what? The truth needs to be brought out on this issue. And so God is telling us, Peter says to the Christian, the way that we are to grow, to prepare for Christ's second coming, one of the ways is certainly standing on the promises of God. So we realize every day of our life that we should be standing on the promises that God has left for us if we're going to be what? Victorious. He wants us to grow, the Bible says, in grace and virtue. What does this all mean? He said if we're growing in these things that we're going to read in just a moment, he said we will never fall. I want that for my experience. How about you? I need that in my experience. There's too much of this blown by every wind of doctrine. There's too much we're, we're hot one day and we're, we're cold the next day. One day we represent Him, the next day we represent the enemy. But He said if we let these Christian virtues right, live out in our life, we will never fall. I thought, man, this is, this is good. This is, this is what I want. So as we go back to, to 2 Peter, you'll notice, and we'll just cover these rather quickly, you'll notice some of these virtues. Now verse 5 says, And beside this, giving all diligence, 2 Peter chapter what? 1. Now besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith what? Virtue, Virtue and to your what? Virtue. Virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience what? Godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. kindness, and to brotherly kindness, what? Charity. Charity. Notice what it says. If you do these things, it, it, it gets better, if, if we can say better here. Notice verse 8 says, for if these things be where? In you. It didn't say in a book. It didn't say outside of you. It said if these things be in you, and then they what? They, they can't just be in you. They've got to what? They've got to come out of you. They've got to abound out of you. Notice what it says. If they be, it says, and abound, they make you, make you that you shall enter, neither be barren nor what? Or unfruitful, think about this, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, this is interesting. If these things be in us, we're not going to be barren or what? Unfruitful. You know, barren is talking about is lazy, useless. We're not going to be useless. We're not going to be lazy if we have these virtues in us. You will need to look today, and I need to look inside myself, not looking at someone else, and to really see, do I have this virtue? Do I have this knowledge? Do I have this temperance? Do I have this godliness? Do I have this brotherly love one toward another? And if it do, are these things abounding? Did you notice that? If you have these, I'm not going to be useless, but I'm going to bear what? Now, if we're not bearing fruit today, does it make sense that maybe some of these virtues, we don't have them? And if we don't have them, why don't we have them? Well, I mean, there could be some reasons for this, isn't that right? Because, see, the enemy wants this, this is, to me is very clear. If we have them, here's what's going to happen. If you don't, here's what's going to happen. And then we have to look and say, are these things in my life? If they're not in my life, maybe that's a reason why. Maybe I'm not bearing fruit for the Master. And But I want to bear fruit. In our lesson today, in the baptismal class, we were talking about the importance of prayer. And the disciples asked Jesus a question. They said, what? Remember, teach us to what? Teach us to pray. They saw these virtues. They saw these gifts. They saw them in Jesus. And they wanted that. They wanted their lives to be like Jesus. And they knew part of that had to do with His prayer life. And so they said, teach us to pray. It would be well maybe if some of us, regardless of how long we've been in a Christian or the movement, that we would say humbly, Lord, teach me. To pray. 
Because I want that power. I need that virtue. I, I want these gifts in here that I might use it for my brothers and my sisters. How long has it been since we've asked ourselves these kind of questions? I thought that was interesting in verse 10 where it said, Wherefore, rather, brethren, give diligence. Now, I want you to notice that with me. Verse 10. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling an election, what? Sure. Now, here's where it goes. For if you do these things, what? You shall never fall. Make your calling and your what? Your election, sure. I thought that was very, very interesting. Because when you say give diligence, it's very difficult sometimes to be diligent in this life in anything. Diligent is sometimes a word that's very foreign to people today. What does it really mean you're talking about give diligence to make your calling an election? We live in such an hour that we need to the word here, one of the Greek words here, it says we need to give speed. We need to get speed. We need to, we need to get with a program if you're going to make your calling an election sure. If you plan on going to heaven, we need to get some speed about it. We don't need to be coasting along. We don't need to be in first gear. We need to be in third gear or fourth gear. Isn't that right? Overdrive in the cause of Christ. So give that. It's, also, this word means an eagerness. How long has it been since we've been eager to make our calling and election sure? Now remember, I'm talking about salvation here. Your calling and election has to do with your salvation. You know, how long has it been, you know, we're eager about Jesus' is coming? I'm eager to know that my, la my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I'm eager about witnessing. Man. Think about it. Now, there'll be more, not necessarily here, but there'll be people who'll be more interested in the church social than they are, right, studying the Word of God. There'll be more eagerness and excitement about getting ready for the picnic. I'm not saying a picnic's wrong. I want you to just think with me. Well, we make sure we have to have our tennis shoes. We've got to have our ball glove. We've got to have a ball. We've got to have a bat. We've got to have bases. Somebody's got to cut the grass. We've got to prepare for the ball game. Anybody follow me here? It doesn't mean that's wrong. That's simply saying if we have eagerness toward this thing, shouldn't we have more when it comes to our calling and election? Absolutely. And that means what? Preparation. Are we eager to get out of bed and study of the morning? Are we eager to break the bread of life and begin to read about Jesus? Get excited for the day. To be covered by the blood of Jesus. To be a witness for Him. For power, right? Are, are, are you that excited about it? Am I that excited? I need to give diligence. That means I've got to give, I've got to give care. I've, I've got to put something into this. I need to make haste. You ever heard that when you was growing up at home? You better make some haste here. You better hurry up. Apostle Peter here is he's talking and he's saying, Wherefore, rather, brother, give some diligence, make heed, get some speed up here. For if you do these things, I like that. And by the way, diligence, one other little word I thought was very interesting when I was studying. To diligent means here, part of diligence is to study. Think about it. If you break the Greek words apart, the first part of it means study. So it says here, wherefore, rather, brethren, get to studying a little bit. Be eager about that studying. To make your calling, and calling here is an invitation. Have you been called to the marriage supper? Anyone here been called to the marriage supper? They had given the call, right? Your calling, because God does what? He does the calling. An invitation has been given me that I can spend eternity with Jesus. How about you? So I have received that invitation. How many times you receive an invitation in the, in the mail and, oh, you get so excited. Oh, come to a baby shower. Oh, come to a birthday party. Woo, we're excited about it. We can't hardly stand. Oh, this is wonderful. The most awesome invitation that could ever be given to mortal man is an invitation to share eternity with Jesus, to make our calling and election sure, and sometime we're not making speed. 
We're not eager about it. We're not studying toward it. We're not putting forth an effort. And Peter says we need to do that. Time is what? Short? Calling and your election. By the way, election here has, divi- listen, has to do with divine selection. Did anybody get that? Our election has to do with what? Divine selection. Many are called, but few are chosen. Or what? Many choose not to heed the call. See, I'm going down the road, somebody can say, Hey, Pastor Kenny, hey, Pastor Kenny. I can choose to ignore that and go on, or I can respond, right? Yes. As the Holy Spirit every day calls your name, calls my name, we can choose to ignore it, or we can simply answer the call. I want to make sure that my my selection, and by the way, the word there, election, also means the chosen. The chosen. And that has certainly deals with us making that choice. So today, you have to make a choice. I have to make a choice. You know, Brother Brother Jim mentioned, you know, having a bad evening, you know. And then he's beginning to wonder, you know, if depression comes in. Is there any hope? See, there is hope. But it goes beyond what? Emotions. It goes on beyond feelings, isn't that right? That's not what I'm basing salvation on. I'm basing salvation on the sure promises of God. That's what we have to do. And sometimes we try to look down the road and say, well, I don't know if this is going to work. Don't worry about the road. We heard in Sabbath school this morning, right, that today, right? All we have basically is today, yesterday's gone. We have the problems for today, and tomorrow is not even ours, so what are we really worried about it? Victory is for today. Claim the promises of God today. Friend, the good news is simply this. It doesn't matter what happens in your life or in my life. It does not matter. God has an answer. He can answer. It doesn't matter what's going on. He has an answer for it. And He is acquainted with our griefs. He knows our sorrows. He knows how you feel. He knows how you feel better than you know how you feel. See, He does. And He has an answer. And the Bible says He is touched with my infirmities. That means it touches His heart. When we heard about how precious the mothers and the grandmothers were today. It touched our hearts. Did it not? It made little tears trickle down our cheek. Because we could relate. And even more so, our Heavenly Father, Jesus, says, I'm touched with that. I know every tear that comes down in your eye. I know every heartache that you go through. Every pain, every sorrow, every disappointment. But He says there's hope. My hope's in the coming of Jesus. How about you? I believe we said in our little class, we said too, if I, if I didn't have the hope of, hope of heaven, I wouldn't care to live on. Family and friends, it's all nice and all good, but you know what? When you're gone, people, life goes on. Some people think when they pass, you know, life's going to stop for everybody. It's not. Life will go on because we've all been through it with loved ones, haven't we? And we've had to, we've had to go on. Yes, pain, sorrow, missing, yes. Those of you who have lost your mother, your father 15, 20, 30 years ago, they're still dear to your heart, aren't they? You can never forget them. You can never. Jesus says, I can never forget you, and He will never forget us. So you know what? I have hope. I want to make my calling and my election sure today, based upon the promises of God, not based upon me. I'm worthless. The Bible said there's none good, no, not one. But I'm basing my eternal life upon my calling and election from God. He's calling you and He's calling me today. He said, I'm with that calling. That means, you heard somebody said, somebody's bidding you to come. Part of that word, the calling, means He's bid us to come. In the Bible, it's very clear, He bid them come. That means there's an open invitation. If you don't come, it's because you choose not to. It's because you choose the world over Him. You choose things of this world over Him. And you know we do that every day of our life if we're not careful. 
Every day of our life, we choose things of this world, and we're not choosing things of eternity. And by the way, part of that word means He, he commands. The bid that He gives was just with such authority to come that you can come with a surety that He's going to be there. You can come with a surety that He's going to be a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Friend, if you want things to change, if I want things to change in my life, you know what? I need to invite the Holy Spirit in and say, I want some changes. You can tell the Lord, I'm sick and tired of the way things have been going. He already knows that, doesn't he? Why not be honest about it? But you know, I, I find in working for Jesus, there's a lot of good positive things. In fact, that's what motivates me. How about you? To be able to do something for Jesus motivates me, but you know what? To do for others is to motivate us, is to do for Jesus. And so I think when we have that work be, when we're over there at Sister Kathy's house, I'd be working for Jesus too, is that right? He said, when you've done it to the least of these, my brother, and you've done it unto me. If we quit looking around and say, well, we're doing this for this and that, we're working for Jesus, we're living for Jesus. He's the one that's giving a call. He said, Kenny, if you do these things, this divine selection, you will never fall. Notice the word I thought was interesting. He said, you'll never fall. To me, when you fall, you just go flat down on your face, flat down on your back. Has anybody done that besides me? When they go down, just go down hard. Seems like when you're younger, you start to go down, you're kicking and you're, you're frailing and you're grabbing a hold of this and you get a hold of that. Sometimes when you get older and you fall, you're like, oh, what happened? The floor came up so quick, you didn't have time to reach out. You couldn't grab, you know, it just things change a little bit. Yeah, oh, absolutely. But, you know, that word was interesting. You shall never fall, and the word means it, you will never trip. Even in this life, when we're going around, if I don't fall, I can trip. And you know what? There's consequences to a trip. You, can, you don't have to fall down to break a back. An arm, or let, you can do it by just tripping. You can throw your back out of whack. You can hurt your neck. You can do all kind of things tripping. He said, if you do these things, in other words, you exercise these virtues that we talked about, right? Which is like temperance and patience. We all have patience. When the Bible said, here's the patience of the saints. Isn't that right? Here's the patience of the saints. And so, you know what? I have to pray for patience. Brother Bobby knows when I pray for patience is when my patience are challenged. Think of it. Every time you pray, God answers that prayer and he, he what? He allows the patience to be tested. You know what? I've flunked several times. All it does to me is to say, Kenny, you need more help. I don't get despondent and I don't want to quit. I figure I need a little more Jesus. What do you mean? A little less of myself and more of Him. So I don't get despondent about it. I don't get shook up about it. I just say, Lord, I need some more help here. He says, good, I'm glad you asked that. I'm glad you asked that because I can give you all the help you need because you're going to be a more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. Anybody want to be a conqueror today? Right? I do. You see, I want to be a conqueror and I can only do it through Jesus Christ. I can never do it at looking at myself. You can never behold yourself and change one thing that's going on. You can never change anything by talking about ourselves all the time. We can never do anything about talking about the, the wiles of the devil and by the wiles of the world and what's going on. But we can change it when we lift up the name of Jesus. We can change our attitude. We can change our thought. We can change our motives. We can change our heart. Isn't that right? As we look to Him when He said, If I be lifted up, we'll draw all men unto me. This is what it's all about, is looking to Jesus. When you are, Ellen White says this, when you're despondent, look to Jesus. That makes sense to me. The Bible already said that, did it not? If I be lifted up, we'll draw them in. You get despondent, you get down, you get beat. And friend, that's going, devil's doing it every day. There's a friend that we've had for many, many years, and he's in, well in his 80s now. Every time I see him, he said, I tell you, the devil's beat me up. Somebody knows. The devil's beating me up. He never, I'll tell you, every day the devil's beating me up. But you know what I can say? By the grace of God, every day the devil doesn't beat me up. Now he gets his punches in. 
That's not any kind of brag. It has to do with Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with me. But you know what? I refuse by the grace of God to get beat up by the devil every day. If that's all I've got to look forward to, I'm not going to get out of bed. Isn't that right? If you knew physically every day that you got out of bed and you went to school, you're going to get the daylights beat out of you. You know what? You'd be telling mom, I'm sick at my stomach. I don't want to go. What if you had that to look forward to every day? Get up and go to school somebody's going to beat you to pulp. Oh. And in the Christian experience, I don't expect to get beat up every day by the enemy because I serve one greater. Greater is he that is in me than he that where? That is in the world. I have to claim that when the devil's swinging. I have to claim that even when I disappoint Jesus. You see what I'm saying? Even when I get down, even go down, say, oh, man, you got, Lord, help me. And boy, I tell you, he'll help you. And then I think about heaven. I said, man, I've got everything to live for. Brother Jim and I talked about it one time. He says it's more difficult to live for Jesus than it is to die, isn't it, for him? He never called me to die physically, as it were, for him. He called me to live for him. And if he called you to live for him, dear friends, he's going to equip you for what you need. Go back just a little bit clear on these things that we've been talking about here. Now remember verse 4 there, 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. When I read those words, I got these spiritual goosebumps. Do you ever get them? Now some of you are saying, what? I get that when I get out in the cold. Now I start getting those spiritual goosebumps when you get warmed up. Are you still with me? When you get in the Word, there's some time when you read the Word and you know it well too. Some people might think that maybe you're not quite with the program, but you, you shout. Right? Some people might think, you know, you can't help it. A word induces it. You read it, and it makes such sense in the word. It's what you needed for that moment. And you go, woo, praise God. This is wonderful. Thank you. You're not trying to put on a show for anybody. There's no one around. You felt like praising, so you did. When I read exceedingly great and precious promises, I got excited. In other words, exceedingly means beyond what I can comprehend. What, what, is that agreeable? It's, it's above and beyond anything I've ever thought about, kind of like heaven, isn't it? It's exceeding. It's anything, it's, it's be, anything that you can think about these promises, how good that they are and how I can claim them, they're even better than what you thought. They're stronger. They're more positive. And you know what it's talking about? It's talking about the promised blessings. The promised blessings. Now think about that. And it's talking more about the fulfilling of those blessings. Uh, promises rather than the promises. I want that to make sense to you today. Did you get that one? In this verse, it's talking much more about the fulfillment of the promises than the promises themselves. Because you know what? That's what's of interest to me. The promise is good, but I'm looking for the what? Fulfillment of those promises. Those promises on paper are not good. The earthly paper, on these, they're good. You ever sign a promissory note or a promise you're going to pay the bank back? Some of those are just in jail very good. But when there's promises here, dear friend, what? It's good. It's sure. And you know what? Jesus died to make sure. And I like the thought of the, the, the promises, talking about the fulfillment of these promises in my life. When he says, your bread and water is sure, does he really mean that? Think about it. Why is it then we carry on about the things of this life and like nobody's going to take care of us? There's no way we can, needs can be met. When he said, I take note of that little sparrow, right? Every sparrow in that right that falls. And he said, aren't, aren't you more value than these? So every sparrow that falls, every little thing that happens, where he's aware of and he says, you're more valuable than they. He said, look at the lily of the fields. Look how, they, look how they've been clothed. Look how beautiful they are. Aren't you more value? So I know that you need to be clothed. I mean, you need to have clothing. You need to have shelter. You need the things of this life to maintain life and you know, be healthy. He knows that. These are promises. Here, when we read these exceeding great and precious promises, here we have divine assurance. 
Do you like divine assurance? See, we have too much people promise, people say, this is going to happen. We have a lot of that, right? And, and we're used to failures. I promise I'm going to do that. They're, maybe they mean at the time, an hour later, they, it's out the window. And pretty soon, we, it provides promise. We just wonder, does anybody ever keep their promises anymore? But you know what? God does. And so I have divine assurance. Everything that pertains to my salvation, notice this, including even the second coming of Jesus, that I'm going to find, I'm going to call it sweet fulfillment. How about you? Sweet fulfillment in these promises of God. But he said, Kenny, I want you to be a partaker of divine nature. What does that mean? You think any of us are going to get to heaven in the flesh? Should there be divinity and humanity working together? Should there be a coming together? That's what he said in the verse that we just read, wasn't it? Oh, happy if you, if you do these things, remember. This divine nature, notice that with me. How does this work? He says to me, Kenny, you need divine nature. Turn with me in your Bibles to the very beginning in the book of Genesis 1.27. Let's get a handle, shall we, on this today. In Genesis, and by the way, those at home, get your Bible. Don't be shirking, you know. You can't be lazy with what we read about. Isn't that right? Amen. Genesis chapter 1. We go right to the very beginning of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Notice what the Bible said. Notice what it says here. So God created man in His, in his own what? How were you created? Yeah. I tell you something spiritually rattles me is when I, I heard the radio this week. And they're trying to tell me that I came from some kind of a, an animal, some kind of an ape, some kind of a monkey. Yeah. I, I evolved. They said to me, well, you know, we believe. Well, these are scientists on there giving the reasons that we evolved. And 27,000 years ago, they said, we begin to evolve. We begin to be down here. Now we're up here. No. Dead wrong. We, sh we should be offended by that statement. If you're not offended about it, well, maybe we don't know your background. Somebody didn't get it, brother, but some of them did. <coughs> exactly. These are the scientific minds, supposedly the best in the world. They have the audacity to get on there and dispute the Word of God, not even take it into consideration that there's a God in heaven. And have the audacity to look and say, well, you came from monkey. You evolved from this situation. Yeah. Something's going on. I read my Bible by faith, and my Bible said, so... God created. That settles it. The evolutioners are out. The evolvers, they're out. And if any of you had any sense in high places, they'd fire every one of those individuals who come up with these kind of preconceived ideas about we evolved from something when my Bible says that God created man in His image. We need to be very careful when we think otherwise right there. What are you calling God? What am I calling God? God created man in his own image. Well, oh, I'm not even going to say it. I can't say it. What are we calling God? What did he evolve from? What are we saying he looks like? We're in his image. This is heavy duty stuff. The Christian people sit around and say nothing. It's time we got a spiritual backbone. We sit and we listen to that. May I call it junk? On the radio, we never respond. We don't write letters. We don't say anything to them. And they're just taking over. And there's many unsuspecting people out there that's gobbling this up. And remember, as we read in the beginning, Peter's, when he was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that he was going to what? He was going to expose false prophets, as it were, people telling lies. My Bible says we were created how? Ah, ha. in the image of God, reading on, and in the image of God created he him, and he said he created him male and female, created he them. 
Now, when God created a male, he wants you to be a male. When he created you a female, you are a female, and we need to quit trying to change it. You get these people, you know, up here, they're, they're a male, and they want to be a female. Now, see, what happens was people write letters, and they get mad about that stuff, but you know what? I'm up, I'm up for it. How about you? See, we have to be, because the enemy is pushing all this stuff on unsuspecting minds and people who really don't know what truth is. And if we say nothing, they'll never hear another side. They say it's normal for a man want to change to be a woman or a woman want to change to be a man. No, that's not normal. And then we, we've gone accustomed now, every time we make a statement like that, we have to start apologizing. I'm not going to do it. I can't do it. We know God loves everybody. But he doesn't like their ways. He doesn't like my ways when it doesn't right coincide with what he has in mind. Sin is sin. And God expects his people to call it by its right name. In fact, he says you need to take an axe to the root of it. So to condone it, in fact, that's why we have to guard the TV sets and different things that we have right now. Because six or seven out of every ten programs that are new of the year, you know, they have the series, these new programs on once a week, whatever they are, blah, 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 and forth. Six or seven of them will have at least, and may I be real bold? People have the CDs and they have to get too bold, just throw them away. Just throw them away. Just throw, well, they thought that they don't like it. But every, every one of these programs, they've got it now, six or seven out of ten, they either have a lesbian or a, a homosexual, right? whatever you want to say, a man or woman, is their leading players now because they're promoting it through television and these weekly programs to say it's normal. And our young people are seeing it and they don't hardly know a difference, is it? Or we just accept it and go on. God said He's not going to accept it. And His people cannot accept it. And he's given us the example of Sodom and Gomorrah, what he's going to do to that kind of a lifestyle. Right. Friend, when will we stand up for what is right? Because we're afraid somebody's going to say something? Uh. Friend, what a time and an hour that we live in that we can make a difference in this world. And, we, and when, you, when you make a difference, people's going to let you know it. Brother Mark, you mentioned, Brother Mark mentioned that even on his job, I think this last week, people are starting to kind of pick. It's, Brother Jacob, you mentioned it several times, you know, your job. People seem to be, it's not just because you're who you are, it's who you represent. You represent Jesus Christ, the devil's going to make sure people are around you that's hassling you all the time, challenging you all the time, and you have to make a choice. I told a young man we counseled with this week, I said, you have to choose who your friends are going to be. You're going to have to choose who you're going to hang around. If you're going to hang around with those who are support, the devil supports, you're going to come around to be a little devil. It'll happen. If that's what you hang around, that's what you become like. Isn't that true? We have to choose our friends. We have to choose those in whom we deal with. I'm talking about socializing. We go to the world and preach the gospel, and God's calling people to accept it. But you don't hang with them, and your life will turn, dear friend, a turn for the worse. My Bible says, how does this take? To be partakers of divine nature. First of all, I was created how? In the image of God, and I'm not going to let anybody take that from me. How about you? I refuse anything else. I won't accept anything else. Because the Bible says so. And that's good enough for me. I know it's good enough for you. Adam was created. Eve was created in the image of God. And then what? The Bible says quickly, sin did what? Sin came. And the divine image was what? It was marred because of what? It was marred because of sin. That's what the Bible said. And then Christ came to restore us. To pay the penalty. So He promises me this. That he's come that he may restore us into that relationship like it was in the garden. That's good news. And you know what? It will be exactly the way he says it's going to be. Wow. And if you want to be a part of it and I want to be a part of it, I've got to come in line here somewhere. So I'm expecting a restoration. 
I'm expecting to be restored to a state which Adam and Eve were in before sin came. Only about ten minutes late. Don't anybody get depressed. Think about it. Now, how can we really, how can we balance this? First of all, he says to me, and Peter is writing, he says we, we need to have that divine nature. Listen, Christians today need to have power. Yes. I'm talking about power in their life. Not showing weakness, but showing power, showing Jesus Christ in their heart and in their life. Not afraid to grab a hold of the promises of God. Yes. Not afraid to claim those promises. Not afraid to claim and say, you know, the devil has no place in here. He needs to go outside. He needs to go somewhere else. We can claim that in the name of Jesus because where Jesus is, the devil always flees. And you know what? You say, oh, the de remember I said to the man, oh, the devil beat me to death this week. Listen, our life must come to this point. Catch this if nothing else. Our life must come to the point to where it was Jesus when the devil came to Jesus. You remember this? When he came to Jesus... The Bible said when he came, he said he found nothing in him. Did you get it? When the devil came to get a hold of Jesus, he could, he could find nothing to get a hold of. No sin, no weakness. Did you get it? He said, I find nothing in him. Well, I better go somewhere else. He realized right then and there that he was up a creek. He realized he was in trouble right then because Jesus is the Savior of what? Of the world. And if he couldn't get him, that left the possibility for Kenny to make it to heaven. Every one of you. That's beautiful. And so if you don't want the devil on your back, if you don't want him beating you up every day, when he comes, right? And he looks at you and says, oh, sins are all confessed. Ooh, can't, I can't find anything that I can't get a hold of. See, the only thing the devil can get a hold of is sin. Are you still with me? Nothing good. It's only sin that he can get a hold of. If there's no sin. If we're confessing our sins, do you see? Day by day, moment by moment, as they happen, when you do something wrong during the day, don't wait till tonight, the night, to go ahead and ask God to forgive you. Right then and there, say, God, forgive me. That's, God, help me. I need, I need help. And you know what? The good news is all. He's never, ever turned any of us down who meant it. Never. That's the good news. And I believe with all my heart, and you have to believe it today. You have to believe that you serve a God that's so great, so awesome, so loving, so kind, so merciful, that if you come to Him with a contrite heart, regardless of your life, regardless of anything that's done, and say, God, forgive me of my sin. Wash me whiter than snow. And then all you have to do is claim it and believe it, and you're righteous at that moment. You're without sin. Did you get it? He said, I'm coming after a church without spot or wrinkle or any such. Isn't that right? I, I, it, it always kind of blows me backwards a little bit when I think it's, I think it's Matthew 5, 48. It says, be perfect as your Father which art in heaven is perfect. And people say, well, I, I know what it says, but man, that's just not possible. You're not believing the promises of God. You're not believing. You're calling God a liar. What did he say? Be ye perfect as a father which art in heaven. What? In ourself? No. Through Jesus Christ? Yes. Accepting his life? Yes. Accepting his merits? Yes. Accepting his virtues? Yes. It's all about Jesus. It has nothing, right? You, we just submit. I'm a sinner. I'm worthy of death. There's nothing good, but you know what? I want Jesus to stand for me. These are, these are the precious exceeding great and precious promises that we're talking about here that I want, I want you to know how real they are. It's not make-believe today. A lot of Christians don't believe what we're talking about here. We're going to talk more about perfection of character. This is just, we're, just, we're getting warmed up on this subject. Oh, not today. I know some of you. It's all right. I usually, not, usually I don't get discouraged very easy. I, just, I go on and people, if I've got one person stay, I go on and on. But I tell you, these, these promises are just so real. They're so, they're so tasty. Amen. That it keeps me going from day to day. You know why? Because I see things going on. Things in my own life. Things in ministry. Things in people's family. Sometimes it just go like this. Oh, man. And then right quick, God brings a promise to my mind from Scripture. And I say, okay, all right. I got Thank you, Lord. 
They're exceedingly great, precious promises that keep me going. When he said, Kenny, I'm coming again. You're part of the family. I'm your elder brother. Man, I'm here for you. I'm going to fight every battle for you. You don't have to fight a battle of one. Isn't that beautiful? You don't have to fight a battle, Brother Jim. Not one battle do you have to fight. You just have to say, Jesus, right, fight it for me. I surrender my life to you completely. Take it, Lord, and fight this battle. It's too big for me. I can't defeat the enemy. You can't do it. I can't do it. But Jesus can. See, this is good news. This is exciting to know. That's why he says, you're more than conquerors through him. Well, why don't we just claim that today? We just have a few minutes left, but why don't you just... I'm talking about let it be real. Don't make believe, Christian. Don't just sit there and if you all puffed up, oh, I tell you what, this real today. He's real today. You're here because you're, he's real. And you have eternal life because he's real. And let me tell you, we have to be so covered by Jesus Christ and His righteousness as when my name comes up in the judgment, He no longer sees me, but He sees Jesus Christ. Remember that. There can't be any part of you in the judgment that is exposed. That's why He says, put on the whole armor of God. Do you remember that? How much? The whole armor of God. Why? Because the little part that you don't cover, the devil what? He has a hold. He comes against you. he got that little hold right here. Oh, yeah, they, 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 they got these roving eyes. <laughs> they got these wayward feet. Woo, their ears are mine. Oh, their tongue is mine. Now, remember, he doesn't have to have control of the whole body. He can lead us around by the tongue. Are you still with me? He leads you around like I got led around at home all the time by my ears. Did you ever get that? That's why your ears are so big. Well, I got pulled a lot, that's why. That's all he needs is one little, you know what it might be? Today it may be doubt. You may be doubting the promises of God and the devil says, I have every right to him. He tells God, I have every right to him because he's doubting your promises. And doubting is of me, he will tell God. So now I have a right. Now I can, I can find something in him. Friend, we live in such an hour that I need divine assurance. What's coming on this world need not catch you by surprise. It need not catch me by surprise. If we cannot take what goes on today, friend, we are in for a rude awakening, all of us. And one of the things we don't, most of us don't like is somebody talking about us, somebody telling a lie on us. But you realize that's how the enemy's going to work. Inspiration, we've been studying the spirit of prophecy. Inspiration says, you know, when the devil comes against God's last day people, and here's basically what it says, and he can find nothing in them. Then he goes about getting people to destroy their character. Did you get it? How's he attack? What does he attack? He can't find all these other things that he's got used to have a hold of them. See, they've gained the victory through Jesus Christ. But then he says, there's nothing I can really get a hold of because they're, they're relying on Jesus Christ. But now, so-and-so will say something about them. Somebody will tell a rumor about them and it will destroy their character. And when your character is destroyed, it's very hard to work for Jesus. The enemy knows that. Because it's very difficult. I mean, it's easy for us sometimes to remember something that's rotten and it's hard for us to remember something good. Does that make sense? Yes. Somebody can tell you one bad thing, you always remember that, but they've told you a dozen good things the person's done, you can't remember one good thing they've ever done after they hear the one bad. Yeah. Oh, friend. As we close with this passage of Scripture, this is what we're talking about here, Adam and Eve before sin. He's going to restore in me. Ooh, this is part one. We're going to get hot. God's Word's heating up. Don't you feel it? His word's heating up when he's telling us right here. 2 Corinthians 3.18, the Bible says this. 2 Corinthians what? 3.18, you know it well. If you've forgotten it, underline it. <laughs> Go back and read it every day. Please do it. 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, But we all, how many? All, all with an open face beholding in a, in a glass. What are we beholding in a glass? I'm beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord. Yeah. How long, by the way, has it been since you've been held the glory of God? 
This is something we're, we're, we need to study on here, but hold the glory of God. We are changed in the same what? The image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. How am I changed from glory to glory? By the Spirit of the living God. If the Spirit of the living God is not in you and not in me, we will not be changed from glory to glory. Glory here has to do with dignity. Did you know that? Glory here has to do with honor. Glory here has to do with, uh, listen, a, a, a copy. Wow. Copy to be like whom? We're going to be changed to be like Jesus and this simply word, glory to glory, the connotation comes back to say, we're going to, oh, listen, we're going to be a copy of Jesus. If you're going to repopulate heaven, we're going to be a copy of what? Of Jesus. The image here simply means a likeness. It means a resemblance. Did you get it? That's what it means. We're going to be in the same image, same likeness, same resemblance from glory, dignity, honor. Notice this, right? Copy even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Huh. And you know glory to glory here has to do with worship. Did you know that? If you want to be changed from glory to glory, with dignity, honor to you, it has to do with worship, it has to do with praise. A change to be like Jesus. As our message says, you know, fear God, give glory to Him. Isn't that right? The hour of His judgment has come. We need to worship the one who made heaven and earth and the sea. Isn't that right? We need to come to grips where we're at in this period of earth's history. Are we willing today by the grace of God to say, you know, I'm, I'm going to claim these exceedingly, exceeding great promises of God. Do you want to claim them today? Do you believe that they're real? Yes. Are, you, are you ready to receive them from God's Word? I want to receive them from God's Word today. I know that they're real. I know that He's coming back. I know that He's prepared a place for me. I know that He's called me. I know He wants to make my calling and election sure. Why? Because He's called me to be a part of the family of God. He says, I'm coming back and I'm going to take you where I am. There you will be what? Isn't that beautiful? Can you, can, as we close today, can you, can you, just in your mind, to say, Jesus, Lord King, King of all. He looks down at somebody like me and He says, where I am. There you may be what? You may be also where I am. He's telling me where I am, that's where I want you. Has he proven it? With Adam and Eve, he came and walked with them in the garden when he created them before sin. That's the relationship that he's wanted. And sin has marred that, and now we've become pretty separated many times. If you let sin reign in your mortal bodies, you're separated from God. If there's a sin that you know in your life today, that's not been confessed. You've got to get it out because you separate from Him. You might fool yourself, try to fool yourself. It can't happen. I'm telling you today, based upon God's Word, you cannot have that relationship. You cannot have that power. You cannot have that spirit. You cannot be an overcomer. You cannot be perfect as a Father which art in heaven. You cannot receive the latter rain experience. You cannot be prepared for the time of trouble, and heaven will not be your home. I hope I've said enough that you get the point. And so today is the day, right, that we turn those things over to Him as we have prayer as we close. What do you say? Amen. If there's anything separating us from our Heavenly Father, today is the day we need to get rid of it. Why leave this place? Why just come? It's not here for entertainment. It's come, I came because I need to be in His presence. And I know He promised He would be here where two or three are gathered in His name. He said, I'll be here. I thoroughly believe it. I don't sing, but I know it in my heart. I feel the impression in my heart and in my mind as I'm up here today. I, 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 I hear that voice. And sometimes I say things, people say, oh, why'd you say that? I don't know why I said it. I don't know why. It, just, it came in my mind. And you know what? But it's biblically true. I, I, I know it is. And it just came out. You've all, everybody's done that. It's not I, what, but Christ. It's either truth or it's not. Today is the day. Does anyone here want special prayer? I know I do. I, I, man, I need it. Remember, we, we're in the habit of raising what? We raise one hand. When you raise one hand, who gets the other one? The devil. He tries. Right? So we raise two hands and say, I want to gain that victory today by the grace of God. All right? The, this is it. Victory is today. No more looking back saying, I wander, I can't. But 
We're standing on the promises of God because they are sure, and I'm banking my eternal salvation on them. Let's pray together, shall we, as we kneel. Merciful Father in heaven, I'm so thankful for those precious promises. You, di you didn't have to leave us any if you didn't want to. You didn't have to come down here and live that, that life. You didn't have to come down to be mauled and spat upon and nailed to a cross. But you knew I could never make it to heaven unless you came and lived that perfect life because I've, I've messed mine up so miserably. But I'm thankful for that blood that you said I could come by faith claiming that you'd wash me whiter than snow and give me victory. That I can be like you. I can be a pattern. I can be, a, it's a copy of Jesus Christ as I so turn my heart, my mind, my life over to you. You've seen the precious hands that were raised, not just one hand, but I, I've seen both hands and I, I believe the hearts and the minds were raised right now to the throne room of God. Saying today those promises have become more real than ever before. And for anything that so easily besets me through this week, I can reach out by faith and grasp one of those promises. I can hold on to that promise. I know that it's true. I'm thankful that we have a Heavenly Father that cares so much for us today. Praying now that each one is, we dismiss now from this time together that we stay close to you. We'll not say do anything, make any decision before we talk it over with you first and we get some direction. We've lost our direction. We need help. And we pray as we come close to you, moment by moment, that you will lead us to that glorious land. You said where I am, there ye may be also. Oh, we're claiming that today. He said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Thank you, Lord, for that. The precious, lovely name of Jesus that cleanses us whiter than snow. This moment on, in Jesus' name, amen.